book in the Bible that has had a lot of bad press at times. That's the book of Joshua. I have seen it written that it is of little historic value. And I'd like to point out it's of some historic value, very much so in terms of biblical history, but maybe not so much in uh, secular history. I have also seen it printed that it is a book that's largely propaganda. And the reason for this I should outline first before we get any further into it, and that is that this book was probably written around 615 or somewhere bef between 620 and 610 BC. Josiah the king was killed in 609 BC. He was killed in 609. And very likely this historic, uh, this uh, uh, history, this biblical history that we have in the Bible was written at his behest that he would like to have a history of what went on in, in Israel to uh, accompany things that they had in the other uh, scriptures that were later to become the, the Torah. And part of the reason for this is he was also very interested in that time of trying to get control of part of the, uh, part of the, uh, I'll say, Assyrian Empire, which at one time had belonged to the Israelites, namely the northern tribes. And he was trying to create a certain degree of nationalism among the Israelites, particularly the fact that a lot of, a lot, a lot of those people might have some memory of having been in that territory at one time. So there is that propaganda aspect. The first time I read that, I was astonished that somebody would write that, but as I go through it, I, I see that there's a certain element of that. I also found something rather interesting this past week as I got further into this material and looking at some of the chapters 11 through 23, is that what we have seen in the first 10 chapters of, of, of Josiah are, are quite interesting in this regard. We find, if we go through a very quick review, and we're going to do a quick review in less than two minutes here, of everything that we have in those first 10 chapters, Try to keep this in mind. Just about everything that is happening that we're going to see in these first 10 chapters is within about a 50 mile radius of a place called Gilgal, all right around the region of, of Jericho. The first thing we get is something concerning Rahab. Chapter 1 deals. I, I swear I was, not going to get, I was not going to let this computer confuse me this time. It will. <laughs> Uh, Rahab, chapter 1 simply tells us that Joshua is taking over because Moses has died. The Israelites are still on the other side of the Jordan River. Joshua is now in charge and he sends some uh, spies out to reconnoiter, uh, to look, look over the situation in Jericho. And that's where they run into this uh, prostitute, Rahab, who knows that the Israelites have been very successful in hoping to save her family from the destruction that the Israelites might bring. And she protects these two spies. She helps hide them, helps them to escape, to get away from the people that are pursuing them. But she gets a promise from them that when the, when the Israelites do move in, that her family will be saved. Her family will not be destroyed. What they tell her to do, let us know by where you are by putting out this uh, scarlet cord from your window. The next thing that we have is a, is a story about Gilgal. Gilgal is the city just on the other side of the Jordan River. And what we have is the crossing of the Gilgal. The thing that was significant about that is they crossed over dry land because, as you recall from last week, there was a landfill that, that dammed up the river so that actually it was dry land that they went through. And as you recall, what they did, that story is not quite right. The, the river is not right next to it like that. But what they were told to do is to pick up stones to commemorate the fact that they did cross the river at that time. And as I pointed out, these may be the actual stones. We don't know. This is the only stones that I saw on the internet that showed up twice. That it has a little bit more to say for it. Next, we get the fall of Jericho itself. And everyone is quite familiar with that story, how they were told to circulate, uh, to, to walk around the city every day for six days. And on the seventh day, they were to walk around seven times. And on the seventh time, 
the trumpets would blow and they would shout and the walls would come crumbling down, come to, and the walls of Jericho would fall. I like this particular uh, slide because it shows the walls crumbling. You notice here, there's the scarlet cord that uh, Rahab has set out. That particular, the particular part of the wall did not fall down. That is found quickly by the story of what happened at Ai, which is a city right next to Jericho. And what happened is that uh, Joshua ordered, let's take, Jericho, let's take Ai. We've had so, so much success with Jericho, but they met with almost immediate defeat and they lost a lot of men. The reason for that is that at the end of that chapter talking about the fall of Jericho, God gives them a commandment, a commandment that they not to take any silver or gold that belongs to God. They can take any other part of loot from Jericho they want, but not the silver and gold. Apparently somebody did not listen. Apparently, uh, apparently this one man, Achan, did not uh, follow that law, and he collected a whole lot of this stuff, a lot of gold and silver himself. Well, because they had not followed God's command, they lost that battle, but after, after uh, stoning, uh, stoning this man, Achan, God then ordered the Israelites under Joshua to take a, uh, Ai, and they did, and they burned the city. Right after that, we're followed by a very interesting story about the people that were in the city of Gibeon. They had, you know, the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai. What they did is they acted as beggars and tried to find some mercy from Joshua by saying that they were travelers in the land. They were not travelers. They were in the city right next door, but they did not want to be attacked by the Israelites. And they managed to get a pledge from Joshua and the other Israelites that they would not be destroyed. And then they found out that they were being hoodwinked by these people, but it was too late. They had already made that pledge that they would not destroy the Gibeonites. <coughs> So we have a whole chapter on those Gibeonites. When the people in Jerusalem had found out that the Gibeonites had managed to get by in the way that they had, they were very much frightened because they thought that Gibeon was a stronger city than either Ai or Jericho. And in, in this story, we get a story in this chapter, we get a story about how this man, uh, Denozek, a king of Jerusalem, got together a coalition of some other kings and to try to interfere with any uh, effort that the Gibeonites might have. And actually what they wanted to do was destroy Gibeon. Joshua finds out about this, follows them, and they are then, the, uh, this coalition is being attacked by hailstones. Here are some pictures of the hailstones and that is where something strange happened. The battle was won because of the fact Joshua had called for what? For the sun and the moon not to move, for the sun to stand still. This is where we get that story of the, the sun standing still. Now, that takes us all the way through chapter 10. And as I indicated, we're not getting more than about 50 miles from, from uh, Gilgal. Not more than about 50 miles from where they started. It's very interesting to take a look at the next verse. Oh, it's not a the next verse, actually, I think I will get that next verse. I'd like to see that. When Javan, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent to jo Jobab, this king, etc. Now, let's go back to one slide here. Here's where we've been talking about, right around, right around here, just a little bit north of the Dead Sea is Jericho and Jerusalem and Ai and Gilgal. They're all right in this area here. And all of a sudden we jump all the way a hundred and some miles up to Hazor. Now what is happening? All, what is happening in the book of Joshua is that we're gonna be taking a look, look at something very different and that is the the things that are concerned with the conquest and the occupation of, of uh, Canaan. 
Now this is where the historians have some problems because we are given in the book of Joshua a lot of details of what actually happened in terms of location and, and cities that might have existed at the time of that conquest. Let's go right on here. And what they had done, and here's where it got the people together. And they came out with all their troops and a great host, a number of, like this, like the sands that were upon the seashore, <laughs> and with many horses and chariots. In other words, what that, what that King Gavin had done is to get a coalition to stop the Israelites from advancing any further from what they had gotten in, in, in uh, that region right around Gilgal. And all these kings joined their forces, forces and they encamped together at the waters of the Meron. The Meron is a stream that's a little bit north of the Sea of Galilee, way up north, a hundred miles now from where we had been looking at. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, for tomorrow at this time I will give over all, the, all of them slain to Israel. To Israel. You shall, shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Let's just take a look at another slide. So Joshua came suddenly upon them with all his people of war and by the water of the Merah and fell upon them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel who smote them and chased them as far as the great Sidon and this place and eastward as far as the valley of Mizpah and they smote them and they left none remain. Do you recognize all these places? I didn't. I'm just going to give you the names that, quite, that we have in the Bible, and I have not taken upon myself to try to learn how to pronounce them. <laughs> what we're told here is that Joshua had great success in conquering that whole great big group of people. The rest of that chapter, up until the last verse, talks about all the great victories that Joshua had and destroy all these people that have been brought together in this coalition and it ends up with this verse in chapter 11 so Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments and the land had rest from war all that was left is that now had possession of all of Canaan Let's give it to the different tribes where the different tribes are going to be. Actually, chapter 12 is quite interesting because what it does, oh, or, oh yeah, I, did, I didn't want this slide. To read this through, it destroyed everything, but he burned Hazor with fire. It was the only place that there was a fire is the only place that he burned down. He destroyed everything else but except for Hazar, which Joshua burned. The reason I put that out is because we actually have some history that this might have actually occurred, that Hazor was burned because they did find the ruins of a, a city in that region, and they think it may very well have been the city that Joshua had burned. There's another part of the ruins. Let's go back to this map. They're way, way uh, over in this region right now. This is a map of, of Israel, and we're going to be looking at it a little bit more later on. But chapter 12 does something quite interesting. You want to read this chapter sometime. Don't try to read it aloud, because there are a lot of names in here. Now, these are the kings of the land whom the people of Israel defeated and took possession of their land beyond the Jordan, toward the sun rising. What does that mean? Beyond the Jordan, toward the sun rising, to the east. And from the valley, oh, from Mount Hermon, and so on. I did not put them in print here, but if, if you want to read them, you have your Bible, read them. A little bit further on in that chapter, he goes to what happens on the other side of the Jordan River. It gives a list of all the different kings of all the different cities that had been destroyed by by, by Joshua in that great uh, uh, taking over of the land. 
Now, the reason I bring this up is that I think it mentions here that, I don't know if I have it on this particular slide, but in all, there were 31 cities that were destroyed by Joshua in this great conflict of getting control of the land. The next book in the Bible is the book of Judges. And in the first book of Judges, it says something that is rather interesting that we should pay a little attention to before we get into the rest of this chapter. And what it says that what you had read before did not happen. <laughs> it did not happen. They did not take all these cities. As a matter of fact, what, what we read in the book of Judges is that, that, that most of the Canaanites were still in possession of all these cities and then they were not taken by Joshua. What we have next is one of the strangest parts that we have in the, in the whole book of Joshua, actually one of the strangest parts that we have in, in, in the Old Testament. What we have is a story of how we are told in chapter 11 they captured all this land and now they were going to divide it among the 12 tribes that had come from Egypt. They were going to divide, the land is there, it's in front of them, Let, let's divide the land. Now therefore, divide this land for the inheritance to the nine tribes and half tribes of Manasseh. If we go back to this map that I had just a moment ago, I want you to notice something in this map. Here is the Jordan River, but there are three tribes that are over on this side of the Jordan River. There's Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. The other half of Manasseh is here. Now, what is Manasseh? Is Manasseh a son of Jacob? No, he's a grandson of Jacob. He is a son of Joseph. Manasseh and Ephraim were the two sons of Joseph. And what we find is that Jacob gives a blessing to Manasseh and Ephraim and essentially makes them sons and makes them tribes. So Manasseh and Ephraim, here's Ephraim down here, are two of the tribes that come from Joseph. These others are all named after the sons of Jacob. These are the three that we have on the east side of the Jordan River. And Moses had given an inheritance to the two and a half tribes beyond the Jordan River. That, that's Manasseh, the, the half tribe of Manasseh, and Reuben and uh, Gad. For the people of Joseph, there were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only the cities to dwell in, with their pasture lands, for their cattle and their substance. Manasseh and Ephraim are now mentioned in particular. They were the two Joseph tribes. We go to the next chapter. In other words, they were given, they, well, let's go back to that chapter. According to, uh, according to this map, they were given all this land here. This is where Manasseh is, and Ephraim is this area right here, right here. And we go a little bit further in this book of Joshua, we get to the story about Judah. So then the people of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of, of oh, Caleb, we'll just let it go. Now all of a sudden Judah comes into the scene. We're into another chapter. Chapter 14 dealt with Ephraim and Manasseh. 15 deals with what? It is dealing with Judah. And if we take a look at that map, we find that Judah is that area that is just below Ephraim. Actually, if you take a look at the map carefully, you find that Judah is down here, Ephraim is right next to it. In between is Benjamin. This is really the center of the, Ca of the uh, Israelites' Canaanite territory, right around Jerusalem, and, uh, and Benjamin is right between Jerusalem, uh, right between Judah and Ephraim. Does this sound confusing? You haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up a tentative meeting there and lamb lay subdued before them. There remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been appointed. We took care of three of them, on the, or two and a half on the, on the east side, and then we just took care of another two and a half on the other side. That's gonna leave us with seven tribes. <laughs> 
And where are they going to go? We don't know. Don't know yet. What we find, well, I'll compare. What we find is that they got to Shiloh, and this is what the book of Joshua says, that Joshua then appointed representatives from these seven tribes to go out and scout out the land and find out what the rest of the territory is like. Come on back and come back, and then we'll divide that what's there into seven portions, and they will put those different portions on a proper pamphlet proper uh, document and they will put them into a jar and the tribes will come and pick out which is going to be the land that they're going to go to. In other words, seven tribes are going to find the territory that they're going to live in by this, this, this lottery. And uh, they make quite a bit of this lottery because it shows up quite a, quite a bit in the, uh, uh, in the art. These people draw it. You see them? They're drawing lots. See the, the here they're drawing lots. According to this, Benjamin was one of the first to be drawn out, and Benjamin was given that territory right between the, uh, Ephraim and, uh, and, and Judah. Simeon was given some territory that was right in the middle of the Judean desert, which was part of the tribe of Judah. I'm just quoting the Bible now. I'm giving you what is in the Bible. Then we can find that Zebulun is given over into another place, and Issachar. These are two more of the tribes. They end up uh, around the uh, Sea of Galilee. Issachar, and then Asher is the last one that we find here. And then finally, Naphtali and Dan. That's how all these other tribes got their allotment by drawing this, this lot. stop at that point. Oh, I want to think about this just a little bit. That, let's go all the way back into the book of, uh, I think it's in, in Exodus, that we find out that Jacob went to Egypt from Canaan with 72 persons. 72 persons. According to the tradition, they were going to be in in, under control of Egypt for 400 years. When would, jo uh, when would uh, uh, Jacob have gone? The best he could have gone is when Joseph was already the prime minister. That the Hyksos were in charge of that part of Egypt and they moved over there. They are now 72 people and 400 years later take us to about the time of Joshua. Be about, that would be around 1250 BC. That's four centuries. That's four centuries. It says there were 600,000 men present in Israel at, or, or among the Israelites at that time. Now you can figure it out for yourself. I tried to work on this, and that there must be a mathematical way of doing it. Maybe Carl knows how to do it. I don't know. <laughs> that if each man had a wife and two children, with that 600,000, that's going to bring us up to 1,800,000 people. And then since there were some other hangers on, so overall we have a, a group of about 2 million people that are moving out of Egypt under Moses. Uh, even Cecil B. DeMille couldn't get that many people into that scene. But it still looks like a big mob, 2 million people. And they move out into the desert. And because of certain circumstances, which we'll come to a little bit later, uh, they found themselves in a situation where they had to stay there for about 40 years. For about 40 years. Well, I think I may have the slides right, right. Oh, no, I don't have, I don't have all. I did a lot more reading and I made slides. They were there for about 40 years. What had happened is that when they first got to the promised land, Moses had sent out 12 spies to spy out the land. Everybody's somewhat familiar with the story of the 12 spies. They went out and spied out the land, and they came back with glowing reports what a wonderful place this really was. And we should move in there. Well, it's a wonderful place. It has milk and honey. But it's inhabited by giants. There's no way we can conquer them. Two men among those 12 stood out and said, no, 
we should move in and we should move in right now. And they were Joshua and Caleb. Now, Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. You see Judah and Ephraim starting to come into prominence because they were the two that said, hey, we're capable of doing that. When we get to this story that we're looking at right now of the drawing of the lots to find out where these people are going to go, I'm going to ask a simple question. Where were those two million or so people staying in all that time? Where were they hanging around? Uh, I, I don't know an answer to that. Uh, I, I can't think of any answer to that. I did look into Shiloh. They are supposedly around Shiloh, and it says that at, at festival times, a lot of people would come to the area of Shiloh and camp there, but uh, two million. And they had to be there for just about 40 years, or about 40. What the, a lot of them died. Actually, what they were told when those pies came back, and they, did, and they were reluctant to move in there, and that only Joshua and Caleb seemed to have the courage to do anything about it, they were told that none of these people that were over the age of 20 would ever get into the promised land. The only exceptions were Joshua and Caleb. All the rest of them would die before they ever got into the promised land. Uh, there still were a lot of people. I don't know how many more might have uh, evolved from that two million people. Can you see some problems? Let us go back a little bit further <laughs> in this. See all those names? Actually, if you read this stuff very carefully, and I, I, I challenge you to do it, read it very carefully, you'll find out that what is described here in the book of Joshua are the actual boundaries of where this particular tribe might go, the actual boundaries. And in addition to that, the cities that were going to be within those boundaries. Now, do you remember last week I gave you an analogy that I thought was rather appropriate concerning the sale of the, of the, of the island of Manhattan by the Indians to the Dutch? I looked into that a little bit further, and I found out it was true. The Dutch did buy that from the Indians, but the Indians that sold it to the Dutch were not from Manhattan. They were actually traveling through there. They were, they were con men themselves, and they conned uh, 24. <laughs> they were con They had to go back home. And what we know about that tribe that sold that Manhattan to the Dutch is they came from the southern part of Long Island. So they went home to their cities. They went to Brooklyn, they went to Flatbush, they went to Ebbets Field, they went to Coney Island. Those are the names that are, are associated with Brooklyn today, but they did not exist at the time of, uh, of the sale of Manhattan. Go back to Joshua. The book of Joshua was probably written around 615 or so BC. The book of Joshua was trying to record some history of some things that had taken place 600 years before. What were they using as their sources? Well, we don't know of any written sources that they might have had. If they had any written sources, we don't know of them. It had to be all oral of some sort. So there were oral traditions that probably existed. These were all put together by this Deuteronomic historian and came up with things like this. This is where people had trouble with the book of Joshua. This is not correct. Those cities didn't exist at that time. As a matter of fact, some of the boundaries, the Israelites had never really conquered at all and never gotten there. So historically, in terms of secular history, how valuable is this book of Joshua? It's of little value at all. It's a little, it kind of, it kind of leaves you with a, with a, a situation that I find is a, a, a little bit strange in some regards because you're faced with a, an interesting problem. And the problem is that I need a drink of water. <laughs> Murmur among yourselves. <laughs> You're faced with a little bit of a problem. One of the most important uh, parts of Jewish history is that they were at one time in Egypt. 
and that they had to be brought out of Egypt into Canaan. That is an essential part of their history. Somehow or another, there had to be what would be the equivalent of 600,000 men, plus all their women and children, were somehow transported from Egypt into Canaan. What we like to think from what we read in the Bible is that Moses took this six or this two million or so people and led them across the, dead, the, 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 the Red Sea into the desert and then for circumstances that we won't go into, they had to stay there for 40 years. That's what we read in the Bible. It's either going to be this, that they all went at the same time, or what would be the other alternative? They didn't go all at the same time, that they went at different times. I find this a rather interesting thing to think about from another standpoint that I ran into this, uh, looking into something else. I think it was Carl Sanger that was asked the question about, is there life on other parts of the universe? Is there life that's like our life in other parts of the universe? He said there are only two possible answers, and both of them are astonishing to think about. One is that no, there is life, but no other life anywhere in the whole universe with a billion galaxies, and we're the only ones, which is astonishing. Or there is life. <laughs> Either of these answers is astonishing. You're faced with the same situation here with the Israelites. Either they did all come with Moses at the same time, and it does look rather preposterous that they did, or they did not come at the same time. They came at different times. I can think of a, uh, of a scenario here. I call it a hypothesis. A hypothesis is something that you can work from to try to find out what may be the truth. An interesting thing about a hypothesis is that it might lead to the truth, but we don't always know exactly what the truth is when we look at the hypothesis. Well, here's the hypothesis that I have read about that I find kind of interesting, that they did leave at different times. Why? If we take a look at the situation for these people that were in Egypt, that the descendants of Jacob that were in Egypt, they were in good shape as long as Joseph was alive. They were in good shape as long as the Hyksos, these foreign, uh, the foreign rulers were alive. But when the Hyksos were driven out of Egypt and the Egyptians got control of, of the land of Goshen again, the people that were in Goshen now found themselves in a situation under Egyptian control and not under the control of the Hyksos. What they found is what we read in the book of Exodus, there came along a pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And that's where the problem started to come into the play. Probably around 550 BC, that a lot of these people that were transported from Canaan into Egypt now found themselves in a land that was not all that comfortable. Well, what would you do? You'd move out. What would be the most obvious place to move out? Move out where? Back to where you came from. Let's go back to Canaan. Now, this is part of the hypothesis, and that is that very early on, part of them did go back to Canaan. They'd go back to Canaan and get settled <laughs> down there. Then, little by little, through the next two or three centuries, little groups of people would constantly be leaving Egypt and going back to Canaan, to different parts of Canaan. They go to different parts of Canaan, and little by little, we have little tribes all throughout that whole region. Why would there be tribes? Well, because when you leave Egypt, you must say to yourself, okay, we're gonna go to Canaan. Where are we going to go? Well, let me give you an, a personal uh, example of this, and that is that my ancestors were Dutch. And when they decided to leave Europe, and come to America, where did they go? They went to Holland, Michigan, that's what they did. They went to places where there were a lot of Dutch already living. Yeah. The same thing would be true with any other nationality. I'm told you go into a big city like Chicago or New York, you will find districts that belong to a certain background. People from Czechoslovakia, I know one of my friends 
in the graduate school were from an area where there were a lot of Czechoslovakians or from Hungary or something. They, they would congregate in, in the like place. Very likely the same sort of thing may have happened here as far as these people migrating out of Egypt and going back into Canaan, they go back to where some of their family already might have been. I cannot be sure of this, but I, as I recall growing up, and I can't remember much further back than six or seven years old, that my grandparents were living on a block on 11th Street between Lincoln Avenue and Fairbanks Avenue, which was not only inhabited by a lot of Dutch, but a lot of the Dutch that had come from Friesland from one of the provinces in the Netherlands. Again, that's not unusual. You would go to where the people are that you're familiar with. And very likely the same thing, sort of thing was happening here. Now, what happened in the book of Joshua is that, well, the historian made a history of it that was a little bit different. But the chances are very good that's not exactly the way it went. It was a very gradual change and that we do have this number of different uh, places in Canaan now that were inhabited by the people that were from these various tribes. Are you sort of with me on this now? Because yes. I'm going to take it a step further here. I'm taking it a step further because it gets us to a very significant part of the book of Joshua. There were these people, what did they have in common? They had in common this. They were in these different locales as people that may have been descended from a given son of Jacob. They had a background that took them back to Canaan. They had a background that took them all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It took them all the way back to something else they may have had in common. And that is that they had the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, do you remember the story of Moses when he encountered the, uh, the uh, burning bush? And he asked, who I am? And, and God said, Yahweh or Jehovah. I am the God who was the God of your, what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they may have had that much in common that they did have a common, a common religion uh, aspect to their lives that took them back, back to Canaan and maybe even further back to Mesopotamia. There were all these people there at that, that time in these different places. Now, what I think is probably one of the more significant chapters that we have in the book of Joshua is chapter 24. And I hope I can find, oh, I touched the computer. <coughs> Oh, oh, I just, let me just pause for a minute and point out there are two other things that showed up in the book of Joshua that I should have mentioned. And that at the time that the book was written, they also tried to accommodate something that was a part of their history, their current history of the way they were living. One was the fact that there were in Canaan cities of refuge cities of refuge that were appointed by the, by the uh, Israelites, where the Israelites would go as for a city. Well, what is a city of refuge? You, have you heard that expression recently on the news? What are they trying to do with San Francisco? Make it a city of refuge, where you can commit a crime and you will not be punished. Actually, the Old Testament is more specific. It's about if somebody kills somebody by accident, they can flee to the city of refuge. And in the book of Joshua, these cities of refuge are designated in, in this fashion. Another thing that I should have mentioned, I'm a forgetful, that I should have mentioned is that we have these 12 tribes. We have 12, 12 children. But one of these tribes is divided into two. Manasseh and Ephraim are from the tribe of Joseph. There is no tribe of Levi. The Levites did not have any land allotted to them, but they were told to be, have uh, a position within the organism, within the within the, the Canaanite or the Israelite system, where the the cities were the certain cities were designated as Levitical cities or cities where Le Levites could actually own land, they could actually be in in the uh, in the city and be a part of the government and everything, and uh, I think there were I can't remember these are all the Levitical cities. You want, you want to notice something else here. There's a lot of cities that are, that are 
in, in this area, right? They're in the area of Benjamin there. And we're gonna run into these Levitical cities later on as being rather significant in, in, the, in the history of the, of the Israelites. So we have the Levitical cities and we have the, uh, the cities of refuge. And then we get to chapter 24. Chapter 24 is called the Shechem Council. Now it's put in the book of Joshua because very likely Joshua or somebody like Joshua was responsible for this. Actually, if you take a look at what is the history of the, uh, of the Israelites, I got 10 minutes. What is the history of the Israelites is that Shiloh becomes very important as we read the history that we have in our Bible. I'll go into that much more later on during the, during the year. It is a Shiloh-oriented sort of history. But this Shechem Council was not taking place in Shiloh. Uh, this Shechem Council was not taking place in Shiloh, but in Shechem. Shechem was a part of Ephraim. It was a very important city in Ephraim. And in this Shechem Council, I think I have some of the material here. They got Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and some of the elders there. And he said to the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your fathers live, and he goes into the history. He says to all these people, you had this history. Now, he said, what has happened that is rather significant is that one of these groups of people that came over, over the period of time, was led by a very charismatic leader who had encountered God in an interesting way in the city of Midian, and they had settled down with their religion in the city of Shiloh. Well, who was that leader? Moses. Moses did not take with two million people, according to this hypothesis. Moses came with a group of people, probably largely Levites, moved from where? From Egypt, and they settled down in the city in Ephraim, in the, in the province of Ephraim, in the city of Shiloh. What they had picked up when they were on their way were some of the things that we read about when we read the, uh, the Torah, when we read about the stories of Moses, of all the things that occurred in the desert, they may have been things that actually had occurred to this group of people that had moved out where? Out of Egypt as a group and moved into Shiloh. The other tribes are all around here yet. They don't know anything about this. What happens though is that we find out that it isn't long before we find that all of the Israelites are following the law of Moses, you might say. Why? Because of this council that was held at Shechem. The Shechem council says, among what the Shechem council does, I, I should, may you read this yourself? Yeah, it, it's a very interesting chapter to read. It, what what, 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 what the, the historian is doing, so you had this background, this common background, of having a God of your fathers, a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You also have a background that you have come out of Egypt and you are here now in Canaan. How did this come about? Well, maybe it came about because this God that you worship is the God that is being worshiped by the people in Shiloh, by the people that had come along with Moses. And what he, what the, what, what the book, what the Council of Shechem is doing, say now, why don't we have all tribes, all the tribes, abide by the laws, about the commands, about the things that we find that are being proposed by the people that are living in Shiloh, the people that now have the Ark of the Covenant, that now have the tabernacle, and say, let's all follow that religion. And suddenly what we find then is that all 12 tribes have a similar background if they're gonna take the background that they have the people that were in, uh, in Shiloh. Now that's a hypothesis. Can it change? What makes a hypothesis change? New information or a new way of, or, or simply disproving part of, a hypo of uh, the suggestions that are made? We don't know. But this hypothesis seems to work in terms of what probably really happened is that there were a massive number of people that were descendants from the people that had come to Egypt originally with Jacob and now found themselves in Canaan. Not as one big group, but as a number of groups. 
they did have a common background. And what this, uh, this council at, Sh at Shechem is doing is that we now have this common background of uh, the, the same God of our fathers, but we also have the God that took us out of Egypt and brought us into Canaan. These are, th that's who we are now. Now, what, what, what time? I got a little bit of time. As I mentioned to you earlier, that one of the things that we find about all this division of the power, oh, this is Joshua, I should have read, read all this. Oh, I should mention also, this is another thing that's rather typical. Joshua had, uh, Joshua had all these things written out and put on a stone. And this is a stone, see the stone back there? That's in the region of Shechem. I've got a few minutes, so I want to go through this. When did this all happen? They think it probably, this council of Shechem, probably happened sometime about the time of Joshua. We ought to put him in there. Maybe sometime around 1250 plus or minus 25 years or so that these people sort of united in this fashion and said, okay, we do have something in common. When they took this upon themselves to have something in common, like the, the heritage that we have with their, their fathers, the God of their fathers, but also this being brought out of Egypt, they started to develop uh, an ethni ethnicity, I can say the word, an ethnic. They started to look as a group that were different from the Canaanites. They, 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 they behaved differently. They, they had a religion that was not a Canaan. The Canaanites were very much involved with their pantheon of all these different gods. But this group, these people, they, they were different. They worshiped only one God and they had, they had a common heritage. This all started around 1200, 1250 BC. Ramses II, the most famous of all the, the Egyptian pharaohs, died around 1240, 12, or around 1229 BC, I think it was. And he was succeeded by his son, Merneptah. Now, Merenepta was a rather interesting guy because he got interested in what was around him. And he traveled, and he traveled, and he traveled into Canaan. And when he was in Canaan, he reported about various things that he had observed. This is a little bit about, about Merenepta. See, he died around uh, 12, and a lot of what he observed, he had put on a stone, and it's called uh, the Merneptah stone, or Merneptah steel. That Merneptah steel is a fascinating thing to <coughs> read, because in part of it, if you could read Egyptian, you would read down yeah. here. I'm sorry, this doesn't work anymore. You would read down here, you see the little part that's uh, encircled in red? It says, Israel is a waste of the sea. Now, I want to take a look at it a little more carefully. This is what it actually reads. Now, you want to read this rather carefully. Canaan has been plundered into every sort of woe. This is Merneptah talking about what he saw when he was in, in Canaan. Ashkelon, a city, has been overturned. Gezer has been captured. Yoham has non existent. Then Israel is laid waste and the seed is not. Israel is not shown here as a city. It is shown as a group of people. So around, somewhere around 1200, somewhere before 1203 BC, when Merneptah had died, he had been in Israel. He had been in Canaan and observed that there were a group of people that were ethnic, ethnic I can't say, that, had, that, had, that were different in terms of their, their, their ethics and all that. And he just referred to them as Israel, as Israel. That is the first mention that we have of Israel anywhere in secular history. This, this came about from a discovery by a man named Petri, Petri, Flinders Petri, I think that name Flinders must be a family name. He is the one that discovered this. Now the fact that he's the one that discovered that stone and discovered that reading on the stone. He said that he felt that that was probably the most important discovery that he had ever made in terms of archeology. span This is rather fascinating because uh, 
Petri, Petri is also regarded as the father of archaeology. He's the one that took archaeology from picks and shovels to camel hair brushes and made a science of it. He's the one that devised the whole idea that we can date things by looking at the designs that we have on pottery and, and, and worked out a whole system that made uh, the uh, understanding of pottery one of the most powerful tools that uh, archaeologists had before carbon-14. But he said that this idea of Israel actually being recognized by Merneptah as far back as 1203 BC indicates that something had been going on in that part of the region that allowed these people to be able to associate themselves with a god that was not only the god of their fathers, but the one that had brought them out of Egypt. Now, I did not get as far as I wanted to because the next chapter, right after uh, chapter uh, uh, 20, uh, ch uh, right after this uh, uh, chapter 24 is the book of Judges. And as I indicated earlier, we find from the book of Judges that a lot of the things that were said or written in Joshua could not have <coughs> been. And what the book of Judges tries to do a little bit more. Next week, we'll take a look at some things concerning the book of Judges and what the purpose of that book was. I can assure you we are not going to go through all 12 Judges, but point out what there was something about the 12 Judges that they all had in common that reflected very strongly on this whole idea of, this, of the book of Judges being a part of what we call the Deuteronomic history and how history was shown in the stories of these Judges. That's it for today. I'm running out of voice. <laughs> <laughs> 50 minutes.